pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a variety of different projects. Um, to get us started, just a few disclosures. I am an employee of Partners, and we offer fee-for-service molecular diagnostics, as well as employee of Broad, which also has fee-for-service um, diagnostic testing. And I receive NIH funding for a number of programs. Um, so to sort of set the context for a lot of the things I'll talk about today, I, I tend to look at genetic and genomic tests across sort of three domains. The technical portion of it that really defines the analytic validity of tests, the interpretive component, the clinical validity, and then its impact. Is it clinically useful in a, in a patient context? So the technical is a challenging area already because, as all of us know, the technology is evolving very quickly. It's hard to sort of lock it down and define its validity. Um, and we don't want to do that because we really want to benefit from the constant innovation. So that makes it challenging, but I would argue not nearly as challenging as the interpretive challenges we have today with what we do with the millions. There's over 100 million variants that have been discovered um, in our genomes, and how do we interpret them? Um, and then, you know, really a major issue we're challenged with, particularly in the U.S., is the lack of reimbursement for the test because of lack of defined clinical utility and trying to demonstrate that is important. So most of today I'm going to focus on the interpretive challenges. I will start out talking about one study that we're doing to really try to help define the clinical utility of, of genomic information, and that's the MedSeq study. And this is a project led by Robert Green um, that's a randomized pilot clinical trial. And the way that trial is constructed is to enroll 200 patients, half of whom have cardiac disease, in this case specifically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who are co-enrolled with their cardiologists. So each cardiologist enrolls about 10 of their patients. And then the other half of the study is healthy patients, co-enrolling them with their primary care physicians. And then we randomize them to either receiving whole genome sequencing or standard of care, which is in essence a family history. Um, my role in it is to oversee the genome sequencing and the interpretation of that data that gets returned to patients. Uh, and then we study the return process, so we actually uh, record all of the disclosures of the physicians disclosing information to the patients, and we survey both the physicians and the patients, understanding what they take away from that information, what they do with it, tests that are ordered, those sorts of things. We have economic analyses in terms of um, what costs are being spent in reaction to the tests being ordered. So this, um, one of the parts of this was first to design a genomic report. So what do you put in a genome <laughs> report, and how can you make it simple enough for a cardiologist or a primary care physician to digest that information? So we designed a report that had everything summarized on one page at a very high level, and that ranged from monogenic disease risk, let's say a BRCA1 variant putting the patient at risk for breast cancer, um, a section on carrier status uh, for recessive variants, a section on pharmacogenomic associations, and we covered uh, variants that contribute to metabolism of, of five different drugs. Uh, and then we also um, did red blood cell and platelet antigen prediction to detect um, risk for transfusion and rejection, things like that, as well as donation, donation of blood. So that was our overall front page that gave an overview of everything that was found. And then there would be subsequent pages where we would go into detail on each variant. What was the evidence for pathogenicity? What is the disease? In some cases, these are diseases that the primary care physician may never have heard of for rare diseases, the inheritance patterns, that information for each variant. And some physicians might stop at the front page and refer. Others might go on and dive into those details. Um, and then additional information about the contextualization of the pharmacogenomic information, as well as the um, red blood cell antigen predictions. So we have actually enrolled all 200 patients into this study um, and interpreted all of their genomes to date. And so what did we find um, in that category? So in the Mendelian disease risk category, 21 percent of these individuals had a secondary finding um, of disease risk, and I'll, I'll show a list of all those findings in just a second. Now, I should say that that draws from 4,600 genes that we assembled at the start of the project, which was any gene that anyone had made a claim for its role in disease. Not a valid claim, necessarily, but a claim, and that will become important later. 92% um, of the patients had carrier status return. That's not surprising. Um, on average, two to three variants per patient. And then for the patients that were in the cardiology cohort, half of them um, 
those r randomized to getting their sequence, we identified the cause of their cardiomyopathy in half of those cases. Um, so that was the overall genomic findings. Now, how did we actually find those variants? What was the process of reviewing the genomes, which, as you know, um, is around about up to five million variants per patient. So what was our filtering strategy? So not unlike, I think, a lot of clinical labs doing this effort, we would filter on uh, variants found in known uh, clinical databases, like HGMD and ClinVar applying a frequency filter to at least get rid of the real obvious junk. Um, we would also apply a novel loss of function prediction algorithm for any variant in a gene that had been associated with disease, again, applying a frequency filter to get rid of the junk. That would leave us with about 200 to 300 variants per case to review the specific evidence on. Now, at the start of this, that was really a lot of work to review 200 to 300 variants and all of the evidence. So we quickly needed to filter that down. And so we started building exclusion data sets. One was our own data where you know, technical artifacts that are common in your own data set that you can remove, um, issues with nomenclature not mapping to other databases, things like that where we could just use our, the commonality in our own data set to exclude uh, variants. We also began building the gene exclusion data set. A lot of those 4,600 genes really don't have sufficient evidence for a role in disease, and as we review each variant, we'd also review the gene. In some cases, just throw the gene out, and then we wouldn't have to review any variants in that gene going forward until we felt the need to re-review it. Um, and then, of course, the variant. Um, if we reviewed a specific variant, found it didn't have evidence, we could exclude that in future cases. So after we built the exclusion data sets from the first 50 cases, that it got us down to 10 to 30 variants per case. So it was a pretty good reduction in the um, variants that we were having to review per case. Now we still, that still left, you know, 13 percent of those variants that you had to review in each case. They're all always different, rare, very rare, unique variants. And on average, we ended up reporting about 18 percent of the sort of 10 to 30 we would find in a, in a patient. Over time, that will continue to go down. This is sort of where we were after the first 50 cases. So this is actually a list of the variants that we found for monogenic disease risk, the 21 variants. Um, and we reported three categories uh, of sort of variant classification. Those we called pathogenic, those that were likely pathogenic, and we did include a subset of uncertain significance variants where we favored pathogenicity. I wouldn't normally return these in my clinical service, but for this particular research study, we included those wanting to understand how patients deal with uncertain results and what kind of medical follow-up they do with a variant that is still uncertain. That, so that's what was returned, or some of these are still in the process of being returned. Um, we are now undergoing an actual evaluation of each of the patients to see if they have evidence of the diseases that we reported back. Now, if you look at this list, nearly all of these are diseases do, that do not have 100 percent penetrance. Um, many of them are adult onset disorders. And so it's not surprising that in ostensibly healthy individuals, you would find variants putting them potentially at risk, but for which they don't have an overt phenotype. Now, in some of these, the ones that I circled in green, upon re return of the results, we did find the phenotype. Uh, this individual does have bilateral hearing aids, has had them since his 20s, and has a family history of dominant hearing loss, so that was um, validation of that. This person with an eye disease, fundus albipunctatus, he has the eye disease that was only discovered upon disclosure of the results. Um, a couple of these, there is some evidence either a family history in the case of the Alzheimer's disease risk um, and this skin disorder where there's some indication, but we're still a little unclear. On the other hand, this patient that, we, that was uh, worked up for cardiac disease through uh, EKG uh, and Holter monitor does not have any evidence of disease at this point. So, you know, in that category, you're now left with, well, did we get the variant wrong? You know, it's likely pathogenic, but that doesn't we, we at the start weren't 100 percent certain, and so maybe the variant isn't pathogenic, or you know the, the phenotype is not fully penetrant. And, and this is where we are left challenged with a number of these cases as to whether these patients really are at risk or not. And I think that sort of leads to the next phase of this talk, which is really about how we can improve our understanding of variation, um, both uh, you know, improve our knowledge of DNA variation, our consistency in the classifying variants, and I would argue that will require and does require massive effort in data sharing. 
um, which brings me to the ClinGen project and, and really a, a major project that I've been involved for the last few years. And the goal of this project is to create an authoritative central resource that defines the clinical relevance of both genes and variants for their use in medicine and research. And we start really promoting a lot of data sharing. I'll talk about some of the data sharing efforts that we have to help bring evidence to the table. Um, and then we ask questions of that information at the gene level. Is this gene validly associated with disease? Is this variant pathogenic? Is this information actionable for a patient? Um, and all of that you know, question answering then results in a curated genomic knowledge base. To date, the knowledge base that we have launched is ClinVar, and I'll talk a bit about ClinVar. We are also building a gene-centric database that isn't yet launched, um, but with the ultimate goal of, of improving patient care at the end of the day. Um, this effort has been written up uh, in our marker paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this past May, and there's lots of information on our website about it. To date, there's over 400 people involved in our work groups from over 90 institutions. So it's a fairly wide-ranging project. This um, shows our steering committee, program coordinators, and the major work groups that we have supporting the activities of ClinGen, and it spans um, variant interpretation, phenotyping approaches, informatics infrastructure, data models to support the formats and the structures of data we collect, specific clinical domain work groups that are, and we now have more than even what's listed here, um, education groups to educate the community and, and uh, recruit data, uh, consent um, work groups, uh, groups that have now developed a, a framework for gene curation, actionability, electronic health records, so sort of a lot of different activities within this program. So as I mentioned, one of the key uh, resources that we've developed in collaboration with NCBI, uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, is ClinVar. And the um, idea of ClinVar is to have a place where everybody can share their data and particularly their interpretations of variants. So it's a variant-centric database, not a patient-centric database. Um, and those variant interpretations can be submitted from any domain, whether it's researchers, either published or unpublished data. We have a huge effort in recruiting data from clinical labs because of the very systematic curation that's happened in clinical labs. We, f we both take data from expert working groups that are outside of our effort as well as form our own and, and bring that data in. We also recruit directly from um, clinics and patients who have genetic test reports that we can um, gather the, the variants off those reports. We also interface with other databases, locus-specific databases and other databases. All of OMIM is in ClinVar, for example. Um, we're working with PharmGKB to get all of the pharmacogenomic information into ClinVar, et cetera. So to date, um, there's over 400 groups that have submitted to ClinVar, representing over 171,000 submissions over 120,000 unique interpreted variants, and that's just in the two years that we've had this system live. So it's been fairly successful at, at pulling in these submissions. Now, you know, one of the things that about five years ago when we were conceptualizing ClinVar, the first idea was to have a clinical grade variant database. And the only things in it were variants that we fully understand and can, and, and are interpreted. And, and my first comment was, that's great, but there'll be almost nothing in it. <laughs> and most of what I have to interpret on my patients that I test is things we don't understand that well. And so, you know, a lot of us began advocating for a database that everything went into. And that's great in one hand, but then it becomes difficult to decide what to trust within that database. And any of you who have used ClinVar can probably recognize that there are grades of quality in it, right? Um, not the least of which is because all of OMIM was put into it, which contains a lot of data, historical data, that wasn't well curated. So, so we developed a system to kind of grade the level of review that those variants have undergone. Uh, it's a star system. And ClinGen reviews applications for the top two tiers. So if you are a, have written a practice guideline from a professional society, um, we have a review process to review th that you know, guideline, and then if it's approved, and there's two of them right now, the ACMG guideline on CF variants for screening and the CPIC for pharmacogenomics. Those are some guidelines that have been approved. The expert panels that have applied for their approach to classification as a group include the CFTR2 project, 
Insight for Colon Cancer, PharmGKB for Pharmacogenomics, and the Enigma Program for Breast Cancer Variants. They all have this three-star status, um, having had multiple institutions represented, multiple different types of expertise, clinicians, laboratorians, researchers, et cetera, um, as well as a method for variant classification that we've reviewed and, and endorsed. Um, and you know, mechanisms to review conflict of interest, all sorts of things that go into getting that status. Um, the rest of the data is in the single submitter category. And just in the past uh, few months ago, we implemented a new segregation of single submitters. Um, so because most of the data is in that category, but there's still a significant difference in the quality from single submitters. So we developed a process that groups could apply for a single star status, which means you have to supply your method for variant interpretation, and that is posted in ClinVar with your submissions. So at least there's trans. It's not that we review it and approve it. It's just that there's transparency in the approach that's been taken. You have to attest to a systematic review of evidence. You have to use at least a three-tiered system of variant classification. Um, so those those and you have to either submit your evidence with your variant claim or be willing to be contacted to supply the evidence upon a request. So all of those things are required to get that single star status. Um, if you don't, you're in the, relegated to the no star category. Um, then if all of the submitters for a variant all agree with each other and there's multiples, it automatically gets two stars so that then there's sort of redundancy of, of the claim. So that's sort of how we've created this structure. Now, Having had lots of submissions, we were able to look at consistency of interpretation. And in the paper we published in May, um, at that point in time, 11% of the variants in ClinVar had at least two submitters. So we could compare the interpretations. And when we did that, 17% of the variants were interpreted differently. Now, that was no surprise to me, but it was surprised to the media that <laughs> jumped on this paper and said, how oh, terrible we're all doing stuff. Um, and, you know, and I think it was a wake up call to our community to say, yes, these are results that are being returned to patients and at least one of them's wrong. They can't both be right, right? Um, although I will argue that genomic interpretation is, I would argue, more subjective than objective. It does require expert opinion and therefore it's not unlike any other area of medicine where if you go with a chief complaint to a physician, you will undoubtedly get different opinions about how to care for yourself. So genomics is no different. But I would argue we can do better than this. And I'll talk about what we are doing to try to do better than that. So for those of you who have not been into ClinVar, you, know, you can go to ClinVar, type in your favorite variant, and up will come the overall clinical significance, which in this case shows conflicting interpretations of pathogenicity. If that is the case, you can scroll down to the clinical assertions tab. Um, which is further down than I've shown because I've cut and pasted this together. So some people don't realize there's really important information down below <laughs> your viewpoint. So scroll down there and then you will see the different interpretations, the dates they were made, um, who they were. Um, you can also click on summary evidence and in many cases you'll get a full description, like all my variants that I've submitted, over 12,000, come with a full description of why we classified it, reference to publications, all of that information. Not every lab has their data structured in a way to put those summaries in, but many of them will give you that information if you contact them because you've seen the variant in a patient. So at the very first round of submissions from three of our labs, mine, the LMM, Emory, and Chicago, we compared our data sets. And in that, those first three data sets, there were 104 differences in interpretation from our data. We then shared the evidence that we used to classify those variants with each other and immediately resolved 75% of the dis dis differences from just sharing our evidence. Um, that left 28 differences, and those were largely due to differences in rules for variant interpretation, like frequency thresholds we were using for what to call likely benign or benign, how we treat novel silent variants, things like that that are rule-based differences. We were able to come to agreement on essentially all of them by sort of tweaking rules. So which led to the sort of principle that if we had more consistent rules, maybe we'd arrive at more consistent classifications. So a group of us over a two-year period developed a guideline um, through the American College of Medical Genetics and the Association for Molecular Pathology in the US to come up with better guidelines for how to re review and, and weight evidence for variant classification. This was our team. Um, you may notice that we're all drinking alcohol, which 
might be a reflection of celebrating the completion of the two years of this effort. Now that's the first meeting when we realized we would require alcohol to ever come to agreement on anything related to variant classification. And you know, I say that jokingly that there's, there's some truth to that. It was very difficult to agree on how to weight evidence um, across our group of so-called experts. So this is challenging. It's challenging at every step of the way. Um, and it took us two years even to get to this sort of framework, which still isn't perfect. And I'll talk about how we're going to try to continue to evolve this. But suffice to say, we, we came up with 28 different criteria um, that were weighted by strength in support of pathogenicity or strength in support of a benign interpretation and across different types of evidence, population data, computational data, functional data, segregation, so on and so forth. And so then, and then a set of rules for how to combine them to arrive at one of five monogenic disease classifications. This was entirely focused on monogenic disease, um, Mendelian disorders. One thing that did come out of this, which was really important, is simply getting a list of five terms that we all agreed to use, because they were being used all differently. And then it's very difficult to compare interpretations if one's saying possibly pathogenic, probably pathogenic, likely, pa are these all the same? Are they not? Um, when I say deleterious and you say mutation and you say you know, polymorphism and you say this, it's like, you know, what do they all mean? So we actually surveyed hundreds of labs for what they were using today and then majority of them were actually using this system and we uh, endorsed that as the standard terminologies. So now, right after we published this guideline, we, I'm also part of um, a program, actually the MedSeq project I mentioned is part of a NIH consortium called the Clinical Sequencing and Exploratory Research Consortium. There are 12 sites. Um, right now it started with nine. And we decided to do um, a variant bake-off where we would get all of the sites to submit variants into a big bucket, 99 of them, and then we distributed them and we had all the sites review the variants. Some were reviewed by all nine sites and uh, others were reviewed by at least three. And then we, and we asked them to first apply their own rules for variant classification that they had in-house, and then pilot the use of the new ACMG AMP rules. Um, and the sites are listed there. So we first looked at concordance between their rule, old rules and the ACMG rules, and there was 79% concordance between the two different rule sets. So fairly good concordance for um, these rule sets being fairly similar to what the groups were already using. Now these groups do have reasonable amounts of experience classifying variants. Um, however, if you looked between the labs, a there was no difference in concordance whether they used the ACMG rules or their own rules, which is consistent with the fact that they largely arrived at the same conclusions. Um, and only 34% complete concordance between laboratories in these 99 variants. 60% if you bucketed the likely benign and benign and the pathogenic and likely pathogenic as a three-tiered system, but still significant difference in classifications across this. We asked. In doing the review, we asked them to document which criteria on the ACMG rule set were used. So up here, you can see these eight or so different criteria were used at least once. But some of them were used just by one group here, one, one. You know, So there's inconsistency in applying the rules. We then used the ACMG guideline as a framework. We got on the phone in, most, in many cases, sometimes did it by email, and we reviewed should this rule apply? Should this one apply? Should this one apply? And in some cases, you know, in the red are places where somebody applied the rule and they shouldn't have. And so it was a very good education process about defining the rules. In fact, what I came to realize, and I, and I regret having ever made this figure, is that a lot of people go into the guideline and they print this figure and they never read the paper. And I can tell you, you will mess up if you do that. Because <laughs> there's very fundamental things that are taught in the details that are not in this grid. And that was became evident as we did this exercise where you know, they'd just gotten the guidelines, we slapped this project on them, and they really hadn't been educated on how to apply the rules. And basic things like, no, the protein length changing variant is only for in-frame indels. It is not for truncating variants. So, you know, and, and you get that if you read the full description. You didn't by reading what was on the, sh the graph. So you know, there's a, a great effort in education. Um, and so, for example, this particular variant where half the group said VUS, half said likely pathogenic, when we reviewed all the pieces of evidence, we all agreed that these three pieces did apply and the others did not. Actually, there was one piece that there was mixed opinion on, but in the end, it didn't matter for classification. With these three, 
we arrived at likely pathogenic. So we did find that although there wasn't complete increase in concordance by piloting the rules, the rules became an excellent framework to discuss the evidence when we were resolving differences. And, that, and in the end, we resolved and we are now at 70% concordance on a five-tier level or 85% on a um, three-tier level. And down here I show the different differences. So of the 24% of differences, we would argue they wouldn't affect medical management. It's con confidence differences, likely benign versus benign or likely path versus path or um, whether the variant gets on the report as a VUS versus excluded as benign. Um, however, 5% of those differences would, I would argue, result in different medical management because they're either pathogenic like the pathogenic or one of the other three. And clinicians typically use the pathogenic or likely pathogenic and they don't use the others. And so we still remain, you know, with a set of variants that are differing in opinion. We then um, did a larger scale project involving four of the biggest submitters to ClinVar today. In fact, this, these four laboratories have contributed th over 35,000 of the variant interpretations in ClinVar, which represents um, probably maybe a, a little under a third of them, or a quarter, something like that. So of those 35,000 variants, a little under 5,000 were submitted by more than one of these labs so that we could compare. And in doing so, and these are clinical labs, um, whereas the other exercise was really more in a research context. So these are major clinical labs, um, Ambry, GeneDx, my lab, and University of Chicago. So in that case, we were 87% concordant. Um, and of the 13% discordance, we put 5% of them in this bucket where medical decision making would be altered and that those were the highest priority to tackle. And we also asked, you know, why were we different? And so we recorded for the first 115 we've done to date um, why we were different in our classifications. And they fell into buckets. So one of them was simply the classification was out of date and if the lab used its current rules, they would arrive at the same classification. And that's true because many of us, you know, I've submitted variants to ClinVar that I submitted having found them 10 years ago and have never seen them again. So if I were to reevaluate a variant that I found 10 years ago, there is a reasonable chance with exact data and other things I might change my conclusion. And so a quarter of them was simply when one of the labs reevaluated with their own criteria, they, they came to the same conclusion. Um, we did have an issue with, and this is the fact that ClinVar is not a real-time reflection of, of the laboratories that submit. We submit on a periodic basis. I've submitted now two times, but my last submission is nearly a year ago. And so over the course of this past year, I could have updated my variants that aren't yet reflected in ClinVar until my next submission, right? And so actually 19% of the differences were simply a time lag in submitting to ClinVar. 15% um, were internal evidence. So maybe I'd done segregation studies, found de novo occurrence, you know, had other case level data that was not published internal to my lab and the other lab didn't have access to that and that was the basis. There were 29% of variants where we didn't reach consensus. That was largely due to how we weighted published evidence, particularly functional data um, and other sort of published data. And that, you know, at the end of the day is due to expert opinion of how you weight that information. Sometimes we came to concordance on weighting that data and other times we didn't come to concordance. So overall, in the end, we were able to resolve 71% of those differences by sharing data, reassessing, et cetera. Um, so that was good news. So what have we learned in this process of comparing and working to resolve? I would say that the majority of differences in variant classification are resolvable through consensus and, and sharing of evidence, one lesson. Um, however, variant classification does require professional judgment, even when you're using the exact same rules, and therefore complete consensus won't occur. And I will say our group had a lot of debate internally of whether our goal should be 100% concordance or something that's not. Um, and, you know, for instance, if you had a group of 10 geneticists and five, you know, four said, I think it's uncertain, and six said, I think it's likely pathogenic, do you vote and put, publish likely pathogenic, or do you actually reflect the 10 different opinions and say six said this and four said this? As a patient, I'd actually want to see the 10 different opinions and recognize that some people didn't agree. So I think this is where, at some level, we as a community need to decide if genomics is an expert practice of medicine like the rest of medicine, 
or it's all objective and it should be, you know, com machine computable. So, you know, I think that's where I think we as a community are struggling about what our goal and standard should be. I mean, over time, we want it to be as ob objective as possible, but we're not there yet and we're not going to be there for a long time to come. Um, I would, however, argue that all of the evidence must be accessible so that we're all starting on an even sort of ground. And that the if you're using rules, you understand how to use them and apply them correctly. And we, we had some issues that we discovered in that. I would also say, and this is, speaks to the evolution of these rules, that we these rules would benefit from added quantitative guidance. For those of you who have been trying to use them, you can probably appreciate that. Uh, as well as gene and disease specific. We came out with a rule set that ideally was trying to be applied to 20,000 genes, but genes are different and how you weight evidence for each of those genes is going to be different. So we actually have now formed a new work group that will build upon these rules called the Sequence Variant Interpretation Work Group, co-chaired by Les Biesecker and Mark Greenblatt. Um, and we are you know, taking a lot of our clinical domain work groups that are increasing the specification of rules based on which frequency thresholds for this disease do you use to say something's likely benign or benign and so on and so forth. Which functional assays are valid assays, which ones are not. What genes or regions of genes are appropriate for certain rule usage. So that's how we're creating these customizations across our different work groups, our clinical domain expert panels. And then this sequence variant interpretation work group is trying to harmonize so that the groups, when they're trying to specify in the same, they're doing it the same, they're using the same approaches. And number two, developing much more quantitative approaches to using this evidence. And if you, you know, look across the different rules, you know, I've circled some in purple here that could highly benefit from quantitative guidance. Um, those in blue, if an actual tool and interface is built that could guide the application of the rules, it would highly increase the objectivity to that. And we are, in fact, building such a tool that will be uh, open to the community to help facilitate the classification of variants and the assignment of different pieces of evidence where we can guide that um, uh, evidence assessment. Um, still a work in progress, though. And then, you know, at the I showed you the top of this figure before, but we that tool will be built down here, and then our work groups and the community will curate within it. That's how we'll expert curate. That's how we'll resolve differences between laboratories. And we will open it fully to the community just to simply use it to classify variants in your routine processes in research and clinical care. So look for that to come. Now, over time, variant information changes. And I you know, mentioned that the delay in getting submissions to ClinVar is one factor. We had published a paper prior showing that 4% of cases per year receive a, a change. We actually have a system that automatically sends alerts to physicians when knowledge in our database changes on a variant that they have reported in their own patient. And this system was sending out alerts at a rate of about 4% of cases per year. So this knowledge is changing in real time, and we have to figure out ways to deal with that change. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, 19% of these variants were different simply because of lag in submission. So. One of a different project that I've been working on over the years is this. Uh, we've developed this software called Gene Insight. It's now being commercialized, and we have this application called Variant Wire, which essentially allows all the groups using the same software to agree to share all their data in real time across the system. So by virtue of having the same platform, they can see each other's data. So here is just a screenshot looking at this particular variant where you can immediately see that four other groups have classified that variant. You can click on it and you can see the classifications of those four other groups in the system and that represents a real-time picture of their own database that they're using clinically. So we know that it's up to date. You can also click on import um, and actually import one of the other labs classification. This is where we support plagiarism to make our lives easier. So you can import their, their text and then you can build on it. Add, maybe there's another paper that was published after they wrote theirs and you can add to it. So we all have agreed to allow plagiarism and you can bring in somebody else's interpretation and build on it. They can bring it back into their system and so on. Um, and this system, uh, in addition to sites that have used it in the US, um, through a grant, it's now been supporting all of the clinical labs in Canada um, who are, you know, using it as their knowledge base to share data across all of the clinical labs. Now, unfortunately, this is not in the public domain, so no one but those using the system have access, so we still are working with the sites to get them to submit to ClinVar. So my lab obviously does, but, you know, 
three of the other labs have already submitted to ClinVar, and, and we're trying to get the, the rest to do it as well. So, so that's a work in progress, but it does enable this real-time data sharing. So you know, a lot of the efforts that I've just spoken about, the success is obviously highly dependent on data sharing. Now, we're delighted by the fact that many labs have already volunteered their data to date, but we want everybody to submit, right? And that will make the database even more powerful. So we've recently been putting together a document like why you should share your data with ClinVar, your variants, sort of the carrot approach. You know, your variant classification will be improved. We've shown that. Um, the value of standardizing the quality control. People submit their variants, and then they get back a report of all their issues with their variants not mapping to the genome and their misnomenclature and all those things, and it cleans up things incredibly well. Also, number three is something that I didn't anticipate but realize now. I used to get people calling my lab all the time for, what's your current thought on this variant? And by the way, I'm seeing the patient in one hour. Can you tell me right now? And I'm like, no, I'm in London giving a talk. No, but um, So now people are going to ClinVar and looking up my lab's variants to find the most up-to-date information. And it's reducing the resources I spend in my lab on having to give constant updates out. Now, help if I'm a little more frequent in my submissions, but nonetheless, it has really reduced the inquiries coming in, and that's been a great uh, resource saver. A lot of labs are actually using it as publicity for sort of the, you know, like a green building. It's a lab that shares its data. Um, there are uh, providers that are only ordering from labs that share their data, and so they're using it as a business strategy. And this sort of speaks to the next slide. There are evolving regulatory standards, and getting your lab in a position to come to the next approach, which is the stick approach. So, um, and there are lots of efforts undergoing right now about really forcing data sharing. Certainly at NIH, almost every grant that's issued requires data sharing. Um, and they're even allowing budget to support the cost of data sharing, because it's not insubstantial, the amount of effort we put in to submitting and sharing this data. Um, I think something that could be done more um, put more effort into is research organizations working with the journals to require submission when you publish, that you can't publish if you don't put the variants in a public database. Um, we're working with lab accreditation organizations like CAP to have this be a requirement of accreditation as a lab quality control mechanism. Um, there are already hospitals, clinics, providers that are only ordering tests from labs that agree to share their data, and that's putting pressure on the labs. Um, we also, the insurers are starting to ask the question if the labs are sharing data as they think about which tests they will reimburse. That, when that really goes into play, that will be a game changer. Um, and then we've been having discussions with the FDA. Although they can't regulate requirement to submit data, they can put tests in a higher risk category that would then subject them to to requiring FDA approval, which is very costly and, and annoyance. And so um, we could say that labs that don't share their data that data is not undergoing peer review and therefore is more likely to be inaccurate and put patients at a higher risk. And so you could use this as a risk classification strategy. So anyway, those are some real, some hypothetical, but could evolve in the future. All right, so all of that I've talked about now to date has been about variants. Genes are equally challenging to think about at a more global scale. So how do we evaluate whether a gene has sufficient evidence for association with disease? Um, and I stole a version of this slide from Daniel MacArthur as we think about both two axes of implication. Is the gene associated with disease, sort of the x-axis, and then if so, is the variant associated with pathogenicity? So you can imagine you know, a variant that we know is pathogenic in a gene that we know is associated with disease, Delta 508 and CFTR. But then you might find uncertain significance variants in a gene you know is associated with disease. Um, and we report them in a patient with CF as VUS. Uh, then you have the VUSs that are in genes we don't understand. They're just in the category of don't know anything about them, right? What drives me nuts is when labs report pathogenic variants up here. <laughs> this cannot exist. If you don't understand what the gene does, you can't say there's a variant that's pathogenic in it. Pathogenicity is for a disease. You could say it's deleterious to the protein, but you have no idea what it does. But you can't say it's pathogenic. So really trying to think about this in two frameworks, gene level evidence and variant level evidence. So in ClinGen, we've come up with a structure to define the strength of evidence for a gene's role in disease. And there could be multiple diseases for a given gene that you may rank at different strengths um, because there are genes that for which they cause different disorders. Sometimes it's based on the type of mutation other times, other factors. So this is our um, sort of rubric. 
of definitive, strong, moderate, limited, no evidence, at least in humans, or conflicting evidence, which may be simply disputed, different groups have different opinions, or such conflicting evidence that you refute the original claim to begin with. Um, and that's sort of our, our um, framework. It's on our website, but it's also in the process of being published and submitted. Um, so we've taken this and started to apply it to different data sets. We took all of the clinically uh, genes that are offered in clinical panels for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma and for hearing loss. And in looking at those panels, almost half of the genes for pheo, pheo and para were limited or no evidence or disputed, and almost a third for hearing loss. So these genes really shouldn't be on clinical panels for diagnostic indications, in my opinion. And in fact, you know, this is sort of a framework to think about how to take these different levels and apply them in terms of clinical testing. So I would argue that for returning predictive information or secondary findings from a genome, that you should only return that in genes with definitive or strong role in disease. If you're designing a diagnostic panel for patients with that indication, then I think you can include the genes with moderate evidence. But if, you're, um, if the genes are limited or disputed, they should really only be looked at in the context of an exome or genome analysis, where you're already going into the unknown and all those genes that we don't understand what they do today. Now, on a research basis, we actually include probes in our panel tests for other limited genes, but we look at that data on a research basis. We don't return the data in the clinical context because there's really nothing we can say about those variants and those genes that have a limited uh, role in disease. <coughs> We've taken the ClinGen framework and now applied it in a large project called the BabySeq project. It's very similar to the MedSeq project, except it's in newborns. Um, and so we started with 4,000 disease-associated uh, gene pairs. And uh, Osgay Bursoy, a geneticist in my group, has curated um, 15, over 1,500 of these gene disease pairs. Um, and of those, 906 met criteria to return. And we actually, that criteria included not just is it strong or definitive, but also is it highly penetrant. So we curated the penetrance of each gene disease pair, the age of onset, as well as the inheritance. And so all the genes that we were returning to newborns had to be highly penetrant, childhood onset or treatable in childhood, and a strong or definitive role in disease. And so we are, are just about to submit a paper on that set of genes that, that have been curated. And we'll continue on through the rest of the 4,000 uh, over time. <laughs> it's a large project. Um, so now, of course, w with all these genes with limited evidence, can we ever get them out of that? We either need to say that they're not related or they are and move them Move, move the needle. So now I'm going to talk about a project that's really about gene discovery and supporting that. And this relates to when we find candidate genes, how can we build evidence? And one of the approaches has been sort of termed matchmaking. And so what the goal is, is your patient has a set of phenotypic features and perhaps one or more candidate genes based on looking at their genome or ex exome. And you want to find that other rare patient out there with the same phenotypic features and a candidate, one of the same candidate genes. And so the idea is, can we algorithmically match patients to really support this? And just by way of an example of matchmaking, so this was a patient that was seen by Dr. David Sweetser at Mass General Hospital. Patient had blindness, microcephaly, developmental delay, seizures, immunodeficiency. He was dys dysmorphic, um, but had no family history. Um, and he was sequenced by whole exome sequencing, and there was some candidate variants identified so two predicted loss of function variants in the diaphanous one gene, one de novo, one uh, from the maternal side. The cis-trans configuration was unknown at the time. However, when you look up this gene, diaphanous, the only thing you find is that there has been one variant ever published with a very clear and strong association with hearing loss. Um, this is a paper published by Mary Claire King's lab. This is clearly the gene for a dominant form of hearing loss but nothing about all those other features we found in this patient, right? However, um, and in fact, the patient was specifically documented to have normal hearing. So it really conflicts with the only data out there about this particular um, gene. And as I mentioned before, the cis-trans configuration wasn't known, wasn't clear that both alleles were affected. They did, however, search ClinVar, and it turns out there was one uh, variant submitted to ClinVar in addition to the published case. Uh, with hearing loss. 
and that was from a patient who had a series of phenotypic features very similar to this particular case. They had marked it pathogenic. It was actually found in homozygosity. And, and it was submitted by a lab uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and so they contacted the lab, and it turns out they were in the process of publishing a paper. It was not available at, at that point that homozygous loss of function variants in this gene actually cause microcephaly and these other uh, clinical features based on a consanguineous pedigree that they had been studying. Um, and in the end, it turns out it seems that a homozygous null effect has one feature, which is this recessive microcephaly and associated uh, phenotypes, whereas the original hearing loss family was probably due to a gain of function mechanism entirely separate causing a different disease. Um, so in the end, this case was solved really through matchmaking. It was that one other case that was in ClinVar that allowed them to bring this body of evidence together and implicate with two different you know, sets of mutations. Um, one was this uh, homozygous stop mutation. They had two other um, uh, compound heterozygous loss of function variants. So that's just an example of matchmaking. So the goal is, can we do this on a much more automated, larger scale? And so a lot of us met um, two years ago at the ASHG meeting, all of whom have different databases storing rare disease patients. And we said, what if we tried to combine these databases in a way that we could query across each other's data sets and build evidence for causality by matching patients? We also, at the same time, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Organization was being built and the four work groups that were formed to support this um, effort were really the exact group of people we needed to help provide some guidance on specific issues of API formats for data exchange across databases, the regulatory and ethics related, so what patient consent is required for matchmaking, how we do user authentication across databases around the world, um, and how do we think about phenotyping and matching algorithms. So we worked with different work groups of the Global Alliance, and we really developed an approach. And that has resulted, as of September, in a launched matchmaker exchange network. Not all of the sites are yet connected, but three of them were launched, and that includes um, here in uh, the UK, the Cypher that Helen Firth and Matt Hurls lead, as well as the Phenome Central database in Canada and Gene Matcher system in the US. And now, if you enter a case into one of these databases, you can immediately or automatically be matched with cases in the other two databases. And we are in the process of bringing all these other databases onto the same platform as well. And we just published um, a special issue in Human Mutation Journal with 16 articles on these different databases, the, the API, how we're doing matching, as well as three of the papers are actually successful matches from matchmaking that have been <coughs> discovered. Um, and we also have now a website that gives guidance for how to use the system for matchmaking if you have your favorite case out there that you need to find more evidence for. So you can just go to our matchmakerexchange.org. Be careful about Googling matchmaker exchange. You may come up with <laughs> some other websites. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks to a lot of different groups that have been part of this effort in uh, getting this platform launched. Now, I would also argue thinking again about case level data and how we use it to match and build evidence. And even for genes that we know today, that case level edit evidence is really critical for informing our understanding of both gene and variant level data. And I would argue that this sort of case level sharing is critical to forming a continuous learning healthcare system where we, you know, in real time have data from all the patients that we test, their phenotypes, their outcomes, et cetera. And in fact, you know, if you go back to this chart that I showed, 15% of the differences were simply not having access to evidence from, largely from patients that supported the interpretations. So if we can find better ways to share case level data around the world, then I think we can do a better job. So just what do I mean by that? Let me just give a very specific example. Here's a, you know, a patient that we might have tested with a family history of breast cancer, ordering BRCA1 and 2 testing. We find a missense variant that's never been seen before, not out there. And we would have to call it uncertain significance, right? However, if I had access to three other cases from three other labs in which they may have also seen this variant, but in this case, um, as in trans with a known pathogenic variant in these three other cases in patients with breast cancer and not Fanconia anemia, um, then I could conclude that this variant is likely benign based on this case level data, both the phenotype and the genotypes that I can see specifically. So that kind of evidence and data is critical for us to interpret the significance of, of variants 
and build evidence for genes. So we're, we've been working on this Gene Insight Network to now extend it to sharing case level data in real time across all the sites. We actually have IRB approval to allow the data from my own patients to be shared with anyone else on the network. Um, and we've now built genomic data repositories on this so you could actually even query information that's not reported in the case. Uh, that isn't feature isn't live yet, but will be. So the goal here is by creating these clinical lab networks, we can expose and allow sharing of de-identified patient level data that can assist in the interpretation of, of variants. And you know, as we look broadly, I think these types of data sharing approaches and how we think about it is really critical. There are some circumstances where the notion of a centralized database, I think, is the right solution. And I would argue variant interpretations are best put into a central database where the data can be compared. We can identify differences and resolve them in a lot of the discussion I showed you today. And there's, of course, there's databases, one in the US, dbGaP for case level data, the e, um, EGA here in the UK, our Genome Connect patient registry. These are centralized databases people submit into one database and you access it through the central database. However, this notion of federated network is gaining a lot more traction for how we think about sharing patient level data where it may not be able to be moved out of a country and, and put in some other country's database, right? But they may be willing to allow query of information. That's exactly how the matchmaker exchange database works where all the, there's an API connection between all the different databases. Alternatively, this notion of a centralized hub where there's an infrastructure that supports the sharing and people only, the groups only need to build one interface to the, the hub and then the hub mediates the exchange and the queries, et cetera. And that's actually how Gene Insight works and, and we're using Gene Insight for the ClinGen individual level database infrastructure we're starting to plan. Um, what's likely to happen in the future is probably some combination of these two on the right for sharing patient level data where it's sort of a federated network of centralized hubs where nidices of data are on the same platform are being shared, whether it's Epic or Gene Insight or you know, the thousand other genomic platforms. Um, but then you federate them and connect them through those sort of nodes. Um, and in fact, this is exactly how email works today, right? It's a bunch of centralized hubs, Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, et cetera, that then are federated to allow emails to go through different uh, systems. And so I just stole this image off the internet, but I think that's a paradigm that we can start to think about to really en enable robust sharing of case level data that will be critical to truly informing what we know and, and will come to understand about variants and their role in human health and disease. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, hopefully I have a few minutes left for questions. I will advertise our um, joint conference uh, between Decipher and ClinGen, which is now being held here next uh, year at the Welcome Genome Campus in Hingston. So please come if you're interested in these topics. Thank you.